All right. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this reproducibility showcase. My name is Jing Liu. I'm the Midas Managing Director. Because this is such a unique event, I want to give you a little bit of a background. Midas organized a reproducibility challenge earlier this year with the goal of promoting the good work of our colleagues and to showcase best practices and tools that our entire community can adopt. We received many wonderful submissions from across the campus, offering many different perspectives, including providing a de definition of reproducibility and what can and should be reproduced, making comprehensive documentation that allows for others to reproduce the results in a particular project, developing general platforms for coding or running analyses that standardize the methods for reproducible results across studies, metadata, tools, and processes to improve the robustness of results in the presence of variations in data in the computational environment and human decisions, methods to test the consistency of results from multiple projects, and improving reproducibility with restricted data. So the judges have picked a number of teams to put together this virtual showcase. I want to stress here, actually, that it doesn't mean that the projects not chosen for the showcase are less good, but the projects featured in the showcase are particularly suitable for this format. The videos and slides of the showcase will be online, and you can go to the MIDAS website to check out videos of the previous presentations. We'll also build a resource collection online for interested people to check out what tools they can use we also will have a reproducibility day on September 14, where we'll announce the winners of the reproducibility challenge for them to receive cash awards. And there will also be um, presentations and panel discussions on that day. So today's webinar features two presentations. So I will introduce Zhang's team first. Um, Zhang Silberholtz is an assistant professor in the Ross School of Business here at University of Michigan. The two collaborators who will also present today are Ian Dunning, a researcher and team lead at Hudson River Trading, and Swati Gupta, assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering at Georgia Tech. Their presentation today is what works best when a systematic evaluation of, of heuristics for MaxCut and Kubo. In this project, they carried out a large scale evaluation of uh, heuristics for optimization problems. The judges of the reproducibility challenge liked this project particularly because it provides procedures and tools that other researchers can adopt to improve data transparency, analysis workflow, and to test the sensitivity of research findings to variations in data and in human decisions. So before I hand over to the speakers though, I wanna remind the audience that you can put questions in the Q&A or in the chat box um, anytime during the talk. All right, John, please take away. Great, thanks so much. Um, okay, uh, can, hoping folks can see my screen here. Um, good. All right, fantastic. So, so I guess, um, uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, uh, Jing, really appreciate uh, you kind of organizing all of these, um, all of these events and so on, um, and, and kind of honored to be asked to give a talk here. Um, and so um, you've already kind of introduced the team, so I think I'll jump right into um, the material for our talk. And so basically, uh, in, in some sense, we were drawn to kind of a framework that, that shows up over and over and over again in real world decision making, right? There's some usually complex real world problem, right? And, and kind of we as mathematical modelers seek to match it to a mathematical you know, optimization model that, that can help us pick good decisions in our context, right? Um, so once you've kind of done that mathematical modeling step, right, you can turn to the literature, see you know, what's been done for this problem. And ideally, right, you're gonna identify some um, algorithm um, that you think is going to work well in practice for your particular uh, real world problem. And so sometimes this goes very, very smoothly, right? Sometimes, um, you know, kind of there's one dominant algorithm or it's very clear between a couple of algorithms which ones to apply. But I would say that, that, that often in practice, um, this kind of this algorithm, what you should actually be using for your problem that you're facing as a practitioner is often um, rather challenging. Um, and, and I'll explain why actually with an example that, that we use throughout this work, which is 
um, the max cut problem. So max cut is, is a classical problem. It's a, um, a problem that's been studied for a very, very long time um, that comes up in all sorts of different um, applications. I'll, I'll actually touch on a couple of those toward the end of the talk. Um, but, but in some sense, you take um, a graph, right? Nodes and edges, um, the edges can have weights. Um, and you're trying to partition, split up the nodes into um, two groups, right? So I have the red and the blue nodes um, here on my slide. Um, and the goal is to basically maximize the number of edges that are between the two groups, or if they're weighted, then the sum of the edge weights between the two groups. So in this particular image, we have these, these kind of red and blue um, nodes, and we're maximizing the number of red edges in our case, because the red edges are the ones that go from a red node to a blue node. Um, the black edges are within the same color. Um, and so, you know, we know a lot about this problem. One important thing we know is that it's NP hard, which is a classification that tells us that as this problem gets very, very large, you know, using current methods, we don't know how to solve um, these problems to optimality to get the best possible partitioning um, efficiently. Okay. Um, and so this has really led to a proliferation of heuristic approaches, right, which are in some sense um, approaches that don't seek to necessarily get the very best solution, they just seek to get good solutions fast. Right? And these are incredibly important to practitioners, right? Because often their goal is to get a good solution fast to solve the real world problem, right? So this is very important. Um, and there's a lot of heuristics research, right? Dozens and dozens of these uh, have been published just over the last 10 years. Um, and I would say well north of this point of 100, um, total heuristics have been um, published for this and a related problem um, called Cuba, which is kind of interchangeable um, with max cut. Um, and we should note that because heuristics don't guarantee that they're giving you the best possible solution, computational evaluations are really essential, right, um, to, 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 to kind of establish the value of a heuristic, right? You need to run the heuristic on instances and establish that indeed it gives you good solutions quickly, right? That's, that's kind of why we're using heuristics in the first place. Um, and so, um, I would say very unfortunately, um, this computational evaluation actually historically hasn't been done um, all that well. Um, and so a couple of reasons why. One is that historically, right, many, many different heuristics developers have all used the same standard test bed, right, which is a set of problem instances um, that, that kind of everyone tests on and they say, okay, how well did I do? How quickly did I run, right? And so I've plotted some characteristics over here on the left of our standard test bed, right? Um, these, these instances that everyone is testing on. So the x-axis on a log scale is, is the number of nodes, um, and the y-axis is the density. So of all the possible edges between the nodes, the percentage of them with a non-zero edge weight. Um, and so we can see down here on the bottom right, we have this cluster of points, um, all very, very sparse problem instances. And so our poor fellow over here on the right, if he's facing a high density instance, right, with a density that's, that's much closer to one, it seems pretty clear that at least current computational evaluation from the literature is not going to help him, right? Um, because in some sense, we haven't been testing on things that look anything like his problem instance, right? Um, and so at first blush, this doesn't seem like such a big problem, right? You kind of say, no big deal. I'm going to take these heuristics from the literature, test them on instances that look like the instance we're looking at, these high density instances, see which one works best, and we're good to go, right? Um, but this brings us to another really big problem, which is that um, our literature um, uh, has actually very, very few um, heuristics are published with their source code, right? So um, in fact, uh, we found that that kind of across a wide range of heuristics, only 4% of them um, publish their source code along with the heuristic. And so um, it's not so trivial, right, to go back, take all these previous heuristics and test them out on a new instance, because we don't have the code, right? We'd have to kind of read through the papers, re-implement the heuristics, now run them. Right? This is really, this is a reproducibility problem, right? The, the literature is not reproducible. We don't have the source code. It's not easy for us to, to kind of take these heuristics and test them out um, in, new, in new spaces. And so what ends up happening, right, in practice is that folks are actually, um, you know, rarely re-implementing heuristics. When they publish a new heuristic, they kind of, in their paper, they, they have a table that looks at, these are the results um, of this previous um, publication, right? These are, these are their solution qualities and the run times on the test bed. Here's mine, it's run on different hardware because I didn't have their code. And let's kind of put them side by side and compare. Um, and we see that, that actually folks are generally comparing against a very small number of heuristics um, and often on different hardware and with ultimately different runtime budgets um, because they're running on the different hardware. Um, and this kind of all combines to just make it very, very challenging 
even on our kind of small homogeneous test bed to really understand um, what, what is working best. Um, and so um, I would say that, that we really see this as a reproducibility problem. A lot of the challenges with understanding what works best in literature come from the fact that the people are not publishing um, their, their heuristic source code when they're publishing um, the heuristics. Um, and, and this is all sorts of kind of negative side effects, right? It's difficult, of course, to verify or extend others' results. That would have to start with a re-implementation effort. It's difficult to test out, um, you know, previous heuristics on new instances, which is what we've been talking about, uh, new hardware, tough to search for instances where all the heuristics don't work particularly well. Um, and, and ultimately, fundamentally, these last two points are the key. We really can't answer this key question facing practitioners, which is, I have some problems. What works best when? What works best for my type of problem instances, right? And furthermore, even if we knew that, even if we knew the heuristic um, in the literature that works best for my types of problems, I don't have the source code, right? Practitioners can't actually run them even if they knew, right? And this really kind of combines to, to, to limit the impact of the heuristics literature. Um, and so you could look at all this and say this, this, is a, this is kind of a big, seems like a big problem. Um, or you could kind of look at it in a more positive view and say this looks like, you know, a fantastic opportunity, right, for us to do better, for us to kind of add some reproducibility, kind of implement up a bunch of heuristics from the literature and get to the point where we really do know what works best when and we put the heuristics in the hands of the practitioners. Um, and, and that, in a nutshell, is really what um, we, we sought to accomplish in this work. And so basically, um, our approach um, is, is somewhat straightforward. We made a bigger instance library. We got much more diverse problem instances, right, to test on. Um, we implemented up a, a boatload of heuristics from the, the literature, you know, coded them up in C++, got them running, um, did a large scale evaluation. We ran all the heuristics on all this, this new big problem instance library. Um, and that's really enables us to start asking these questions across kind of a diverse set of instances, which heuristic is working best for what types of instances. And can we put really um, you know, in the hands of practitioners, maybe tell them what the best performing um, heuristic is predicted to be for their instance and let them run it. Um, and we, we believe we've actually accomplished all this for MaxCut and a related problem. And I'll, I'll show you a demo actually in, in just a couple of slides. That's the notebook that I sent out um, that, that will allow you to, to kind of see this firsthand. Um, and so I don't want to talk too briefly on, on kind of the details of our approach. I recognize we have, we have somewhat limited time during here, but I'll just say um, we went through a pretty um, extensive um, effort to expand out the problem instance to get kind of a much broader set of problem instances. We pulled a bunch of real world problem instances that have been studied for other mathematical optimization problems. We built a bunch of random problem instances using a variety of different random graph generation approaches. Um, and we ended up ultimately kind of pretty much at this point, no matter, you know, we, we define a whole bunch of different instance properties, characteristics of graphs. Um, and kind of no matter which one you look at pretty much, you have the same story where we have kind of this blue region, which is the standard test bed that people have been testing on historically. And, and the gray region, um, which is our new test bed, is kind of covering dramatically larger percentage of, of this space um, of instance characteristics, um, kind of pretty much no matter what instance characteristics um, you put on the X and Y axes. Um, we released this op instance library as open source, a um, couple thousand instances. It's, it's accessible now on the Amazon cloud. Um, and so with this, right, we're ready to start saying, okay, great. We, we think we kind of have a broad view of what sorts of problem instances people might run into. Now we need to see how all the heuristics we've looked at historically do on these, right? And so this was kind of a large literature review and re-implementation effort, right? We worked with a librarian, did a systematic literature review reviewed hundreds of different um, publications um, from the literature, um, identified 95 papers presenting new heuristic approaches from MaxCut and this related problem called Cubo. Um, and, and we ultimately selected 19 of these that are highly cited impactful publications within the literature and implemented 37 total heuristics um, from them. Um, and so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that re-implementation on the next slide, but, but we, we tried to keep these as true to what the authors described in their papers as possible. We did make some modifications. Um, our experimental um, design required us to be able to run the heuristics for an arbitrary runtime limit. So often that meant wrapping some sort of a described procedure and random restarts or making other modifications to allow it to be run um, for an arbitrary runtime limit. One thing I want to highlight that's actually very nice about this is we're implementing all 37 of these. There's a lot of kind of shared ideas, a lot of shared um, thoughts, you know, from one heuristic to another. And so we were actually allowed to, able to share 
a lot of code and data structures in common across their implementations, which makes it kind of even more precise to compare them um, computationally. Um, and then, you know, we did the thing you'd, you'd expect. We have a bunch of running code. We um, fired up EC2, you know, spent a thousand bucks and, and kind of ran all our heuristics across this large instance library. Um, and, and then we, we put it all um, out as open source, right? So that others don't need to go through the same effort, right? The same re-implementation effort. And so um, we released open source implementations of all of these heuristics, right? Um, um, as, a, as a Git repository um, and then kind of actually um, thanks very much to this this challenge because we got some great feedback that it would be you know helpful um, to uh, to release these as a Python package and so we we actually very recently hot off the presses have released a Python package um, which you'll see in a moment in our notebook our Jupyter notebook um, you know it's a single line of code now in the pip repository to load this up as a package um, and get access to all this code um, and then to make our own research reproducible we also released all of our data and analysis scripts um, publicly as well. Um, and so uh, before I show you that notebook, I'm going to switch over to the notebook in just a moment. I want to um, say, I think we had kind of a number of key findings that, that we thought were, were nice and transferable um, in this re-implementation effort. We had um, a team of a couple um, different individuals, three to be exact, who were, who were doing um, coding, um, you know, checking each other's work a lot, making sure what we actually have in code really matches what's in the papers was really essential. Um, we did do some modifications, as I said, to the heuristics. So taking some real care, using author's intent when it was kind of clear and possible to do that. Um, but when we needed to make a change for our experimental design, you know, if it was not clear exactly how to make that change, maybe testing out a couple of approaches um, and using the one that worked the best. Um, one thing that I think was, was kind of a very important characteristic of our systematic evaluation was that we, you know, so-called we had no horse in the race. We weren't building the N plus first heuristic and comparing it against all these previous ones. So we kind of had no weird incentive to code up the previous ones less efficiently, but ours more efficiently, right? We were just trying to get efficient implications of all these heuristics so that we can make nice head-to-head -head comparisons and release them as open source, which I think was, um, was important. You know, reaching out to authors when in doubt, stress testing, testing on very sparse, very dense, very large, very small instances. Um, and I would say when in doubt, leave it out. We actually had a couple of heuristics that we built running implementations for, and we just weren't quite sure this was exactly what the authors wanted. We ended up not including that at the end and not releasing that. Um, and I think these were important things that helped us ultimately um, uh, end up with a high quality um, comparison. And so with that folks, I wanna actually switch um, uh, briefly and, and show you um, a bit of a demo um, of what, what, what kind of we built and released as open source. Um, so I'm switching to the um, Jupyter notebook that I um, sent a link to um, in the chat. There's also a rendered HTML version in the chat if you're not able to get it up and running. The really the only setup you have would be um, using pip to install our package. It has to be Python three for everything. There's no Python two implementation, um, so pip three um, and make sure you're running Python three um, in your notebook. Um, but but you know you can load it up very easily um, and 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 kind of do you know normal Python things to maybe build a random graph that you want to run maps cut on. Um, so I've I've gone ahead and um, done that. Um, and then this, this package, this MQLib package, um, you know, allows you to very easily say, you know, hey, what heuristics are implemented? What do I have accessible to me as a practitioner that I can run on my instance um, and solve max cut? And so we can ask and we see, okay, there's a whole bunch of these different heuristic codes with very brief descriptions of the types of heuristics that they're running. These are for max cut. Um, and I said, there's kind of this sister problem called Cubo. They're, very easy to transform one to the other. So we, we also implemented up in, um, a bunch of Cubo um, heuristics from the literature, um, brief little descriptions, okay? And so now if you're a practitioner, you got your network, right? You see here all of the different heuristics you can run. Maybe you, you define a little plotting function so that you can plot out um, a solution to, to the max cut problem. Um, using our, our packages is simple, right? As you know, defining an instance within the packages terminology, um, calling run heuristic, um, which is going to pass one of these codes from up here. So I picked somewhat arbitrarily Beasley 1998TS, which is one of our Cubo heuristics. We're actually running um, a Cubo heuristic to solve the max cut. Tell it how long you let it run, the number of seconds, um, give it a random seed and, and plot out your cut. Um, and so there we go, it ran for a second um, and it gave us you know, a partition of the nodes um, into these two groups. Um, again, those red edges are the edges that are cut. Um, the black ones are the ones that are not cut. 
how many red edges are there, that's the objective value. All right, so it's, it's just a simple couple lines of code. Recall that, that the kind of before we did this, right, to get this, you know, would have been, you know, reading a paper and coding up their heuristic, right? Because this code just wasn't accessible um, previously. Um, and, and so we can, we can take this a step further, right? We can say, okay, great, let's build a larger problem instance. Now it is a thousand nodes, not just 10. Um, and let's build up an instance, a new, you know, uh, max cut instance. And let's run it across every single max cut and cubo heuristic that's presented um, across, you know, in this entire library, right? So we got all the codes, we looped through them all. We give each one one second, right, to run. Um, and we're saying, hey, give us the objective value for each one of them. Um, so this is, I guess that's going to take about 37 seconds uh, to run um, to give us this, this kind of breakdown um, of the, um, the heuristic qualities. Um, and there we go. Um, great. And so we have each of these has now been run. Um, so we have for this particular instance, giving each of these a second, what was the objective value they ended up accomplishing? So we see we have some things up in the 3500s. We have some quite a bit lower than 3500. We can see that actually for this case, um, selecting between these 37 heuristics was, uh, was important, right? You could do a little bit better, or a little worse. Um, you know, again, right, before this project, doing this would have involved a massive re-implementation effort, right? Coding up 37 different heuristics, but now it's just, you know, couple lines of code in Python. Um, and so I would say, I'm gonna talk very briefly toward the end of this talk about like, you know, ideally, right, we wouldn't have to ask practitioners for their problem instance to run all 37 heuristics and see which one works best and use that one. Ideally, we could guide them, you know, um, toward for your problem instance, it seems like a heuristic that's gonna be particularly promising is this one. Um, and we actually use uh, machine learning to do just that. We basically calculate a bunch of properties of the instances predict based on our um, work, um, you know, our, our, our computational efforts, um, which heuristic is going to work um, the best and then just run that one. And so that is a special code HH for hyper heuristic. And that's basically you give it the instance, you give it a runtime limit, you say, hey, use machine learning to figure out what you think is going to be best and run that one. And we really think this is exactly what practitioners are looking for, right? Just, hey, you tell me what from the literature is going to be best for my instance, run it and give me the results. Um, and we can get an objective value there. Um, and so uh, I, we, we sent us the notebook, you can play around with it, um, but, but we think this really unlocks in some sense this literature, which was hidden away in you know, PDF files behind paywalls and now really enables practitioners um, to run the heuristics um, and get the results um, quite easily. Okay, and so I know I, I don't have too much more time and I wanna leave time for Q and A, but I do wanna briefly talk about um, you know, what we've unlocked, right, this hyper heuristic and this idea of like, zeroing in on what heuristic do we think works best for a particular type of instances. Um, so I would say kind of at a very high level, our computational experiments found that, hey, when you look at a diverse enough set of instances, no heuristic dominates all the other ones. You know, most heuristics had some instance where it was the very best heuristic and it wasn't tied with anything else. It was strictly the best. Um, and we also found that problem instances could really predict where a heuristic works well or poorly. So here I have for a particular heuristic, I plot out on the X and Y axis, two important problem instance characteristics and in predicting where it works well or poorly. And we see that you know, when MIS, this, um, this instance property that we've defined when it's large, these are easy instances for this heuristic. It does well, it ranks near the best amongst all the heuristics. You know, it has a lot of trouble when MIS is low. You'd probably want to pick a different heuristic. And so in our paper, we, you know, we fit cart trees. We do some, you know, data visualization to try to help folks understand where heuristics and heuristic ideas, characteristics of heuristics work well or poorly. Um, but we think, again, for practitioners, you know, probably the most important thing is that we then use machine learning, right? Basically fit random forest models to predict, hey, given a particular instance, which heuristic do we think works best? we see that this actually outperforms, right, any single heuristic. And so really this, you can call it an algorithm portfolio or hyper heuristic represents a state of the art max cut and cubo heuristic. It, it kind of outperforms any single one from the literature. And again, this is completely accessible um, to, to folks who want to run it themselves, practitioners. Um, and so I just want to wrap up by saying um, kind of our goal was twofold. It was to impact how researchers for max cut and cubo are evaluating um, their heuristics. Um, you know, add reproducibility to that literature. And then very importantly, um, to, to get this in the hands of practitioners, we've already started seeing, you know, this is obviously recent work, we've already started seeing some broader impacts um, 
you know, the, the, the physicists, right, with their spin Hamiltonians are, 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 are using um, MQLAG to solve instances, right? You know, mining optimal policies and pattern recognition. We've seen an e-commerce application. Again, practitioners who had a max cut or a Kibo come up and they use the MQLib um, to solve it. I think one pretty interesting um, one that, that I would say when we started out on the project, we didn't really expect to have come up, but that has come up a lot. Probably the most interest from practitioners has been in quantum computing, right? There's this, um, this concept that, that we want to identify problem instances um, for, for these NP-hard problems where classical algorithms, the ones we implemented in our approach, um, work poorly, but quantum computers work well. And so actually there's been kind of a flurry of, you know, preprints, but also like emails we're getting and stuff asking about this library, you know, folks, folks um, trying to understand, okay, how do we best get access to the best classical algorithms? so that we can identify, you know, where are the situations where quantum um, has an advantage to motivate quantum, um, which is cool. So here's one of those, those preprints um, um, that's just coming out, folks using um, our, our work, um, which is quite encouraging. And so I guess I'll stop here and just say that, that we, we think that this, this kind of adding reproducibility to this literature, getting um, these previous approaches coded up um, in the hands of practitioners and in the hands of researchers um, has numerous benefits and ultimately um, will, will, will kind of make the comparisons that we are doing within this literature better, um, but then also really benefit um, practitioners as well. Um, and so with that, folks, I, I, I uh, will stop and would love to answer questions. I don't know now or, or at the end. Yeah, um, if anyone has uh, quick questions, please do drop them in the Q&A or the chat box. Um, I'll ask you a couple questions, uh, short questions, and then we'll move on to uh, Nigel unless we see audience questions. Um, at the end, we can, uh, we'll go back to Q&A again uh, after Nigel's talk as well. So I just wanna um, ask you uh, two quick questions. One is, it's a, it's a large number of literature to go through to uh, get you know, the, the results. In those literature, do you see anything that changes over time that tells you that people are getting more sophisticated with this? Oh yeah, God, Jane, I'll tell you, the amount of time it took to code those first ones, it was like this, super easy. They just get so sophisticated by the end. You know, Albert, you know, you know, these various kind of nested heuristics within heuristics and all this stuff. So yeah, for sure there's complexity in this. I think this is kind of natural to what you'd expect. I mean, in some sense, the heuristics literature has an aspect of horse racing to it, where to publish, you need to be able to beat people. And so if all kind of the easy ideas are tapped out, you need to think about kind of stacking ideas on top of ideas. Um, and so we actually think that that, that kind of, um, by, by expanding out the problem instance library to a much more diverse set of, um, of instances, we're really hoping that folks are going to kind of be writing papers that focus in on just one particular type of instances where they think we're not doing well, um, and they can establish they can do much better on those instances. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot more sophistication in recent years, for sure. So Karen Coulter asked a question, are users able to integrate their own heuristics to evaluate them against to ev evaluate them against the published set that you uh, selected? We would be so jazzed if, if folks did, yes. Um, we have a whole developer guide um, in our Git repository. Um, that's uh, C++ coding. Um, the Python is just a wrapper around the C++ code, but yes, absolutely. And I would say the package uh, developers would be thrilled to interact with anyone who wanted to, um, to integrate in their own heuristics. We would, be, we would be really thrilled. This is a big reason why we built this, was for people to keep expanding it and making it kind of a living code repository. Great, it's, a, it's really interesting. Uh, let's move on to uh, Nigel right now, and then uh, we'll come back to Q&A for both uh, speakers. So Nigel Mitchkey is a graduate student in the biophysics program with uh, Dr. Da Wen Tsai as his advisor. His presentation today is a multi-informatic cellular visualization tool for interactively interrogating high-dimensional data sets. This is about their web interface to a set of analytical tools for high dimensional data, helps biologists decide which bio bioinformatics tools and pipelines they can use. So the judges of the reproducibility challenge liked this submission, especially because it helps simplify and standardize analyses in its particular area. 
All right, so I will let Nigel take away from here, if you could share your screen. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, let me share that. All right, we can all see this presentation, yes? Great. So yeah, thank you for that introduction. And uh, John, I mean, that was super interesting work. Thank you for presenting that. Uh, it's, it's a little bit tough to follow up because we're going to take such a big change uh, in direction right here. But uh, as Jing was saying, I'm really excited to present this tool that we've called MyCV. It's a multi-informatic cellular visualization tool that we kind of hope is going to make this rapidly uh, expanding world of single cell R excuse me, RNA sequencing uh, accessible to more biologists, accessible to all even. So I'm gonna quickly go over kind of my hot take on reproducibility um, and then I'll try to outline the problem as we see it, which is essentially, you know, this kind of data analysis is complex. Uh, the solution in our eyes for many biologists is to provide a kind of curated a uh, tool for point and click analysis that removes a lot of the cruft and a lot of the nitty gritty details from the eyes of the biologists and lets them start to rapidly um, ask questions about their data and form new hypotheses. So I'm gonna go over what it can do, how it works, kind of how we built it. I'll lecture you a little bit about why I think it matters. And then I'll briefly look forward and uh, let you guys know what we think the next few months are gonna look like in this tool's development. You can follow along with this work. I didn't put it in the chat, sorry, but um, if you go to mycv.works, uh, this web tool is live. Um, I will actually, let me show you that now. Um, if you'd like to jump on, you can go to mycv.works. You'll be shown this page here. Uh, and I'd recommend we've put some pre-made data sets up here. The one that I've recently just submitted to the bioarchive is here. You can load it up. You'll see some things change over on the right of the screen. And then if you just pop over to pre-process and click the magical recalculate everything button, some more stuff will go on and uh, you'll be able to play around with the data in the browser. So let me, let me pop back here. Um, and if you want to see more of our research in action, you know, the, the paper that came out alongside this tool is actually a pretty hefty biology paper uh, about fly neuron development, but it implements a lot of the practices that I think I'll be kind of repeating in this talk a little bit, and we'd love for you to check it out. So in, in my eyes, uh, when I looked at this challenge, the first question I had to ask myself is, you know, what does reproducible research look like? And, uh, you know, in the purely computational world, it looks like um, one thing, basically a lot like the last presenter just uh, discussed. But for biologists and other physical scientists, I might argue that reproducibility has a kind of simpler uh, definition, which is basically that reproducible research or reproducible analysis is going to lead you to results that are rooted in physical reality. Um, and what do I mean by that? So when I did the single cell sequencing uh, project, I'm actually showing you data from that paper I mentioned. One of the first things we did was we were able to get our single cells, get the RNA from them, and generate a plot like this where individual cells are dots in this 2D projection space. And their relative positions indicate kind of how similar those cell types are. So if cells are close to each other in this grid, it means that they're very similar. And if they're far away, it means they're very different kinds of cells. What we've overlaid in these two plots is the expression level of two genes. One is a long non-coding RNA called Cherub, and another one's a protein coding gene called DATI. So one of the first things I hope you'll notice is that in this blind analysis that we just threw together with the basic pre-processing pipeline, there's two big chunks of cells, the upper left and the lower right uh, kind of cell groups in our eyes. And these two genes are highly expressed in this upper left quadrant whereas they're not expressed at all in the lower right one. There's two pretty straightforward interpretations to this that actually don't match up to, with one another. One could be that these cells are of different cell types. They actually originate from different places and are functionally distinct. The other is that perhaps these cells are going through some kind of cell state change. And so maybe these are two of the same cell types, but the cells on the left are maybe cells that are about to divide and the cells on the right are maybe cells that have already terminally divided or something. 
it's not clear just by looking at these two plots or in my opinion looking at any like set of analytical tools that you can actually figure out which of these two is the correct um, interpretation of the data. Instead, um, in our view, to help us figure out which of those two interpretations is correct, we have to do some kind of biological validation. And what I'm showing you here is from the literature, although biologists have to do this on their own as well, uh, these are expression profiles of these two genes, Cherub and Dati, on the top and bottom respectively, but in the real tissue. So these are developing fruit fly brains and the top is a single brain lobe and in the bottom it's actually the full brain. And what you can see is that the authors have outlined where the optic lobe of the developing fly brain is. And in the top plot you can see cherub in red is not present at all in the optic lobe, but is present throughout the rest of the brain. And likewise for Dati, which is in white here, it's basically not present in the optic lobe, but it is through the rest of the brain. And so our blind analysis plus this biological validation in hand, we now have a really firm reality driven interpretation of our data that we can build on as we repeat this process and go back to do the next round of blind analysis. And so in, in my view, uh, you know, reproducible research is research that leads to interpretations and hypotheses and new truths that are actually rooted in physical reality. So it's a hot take on reproducibility. It's not the same as, as it's going to be in every field, but I think in biology in particular, there's a lot of validity there. The problem in the context of single cell sequencing is this. Biologists are able to either themselves or with a contractor like a sequencing core generate data sets that look like this on the left. It's a gene by cell matrix where we can see the number of molecules of RNA that correspond to gene A and B and so on and so forth for every single cell that this researcher sequenced. This matrix on its own is practically useless uh, to a biologist, whereas Plots like these, where we can see a number of different pieces of information, like how similar cells are to each other based on their closeness, what putative cellular subtype they might be based on some automatic clustering heuristics, um, and what the actual expression levels of genes of interest are across this distribution of cells. This is what's really useful and actually lets biologists generate new hypotheses about their data. But going from this matrix to these kinds of plots is a very non-trivial exercise. I mean, the whole world of single cell sequencing bioinformatics has developed over the past five to 10 years, specifically to deal with this big question mark in the middle. And sometimes, you know, the, the stuff on the right and the left too. There's a couple ways that you can get around this problem. You know, you, you as a researcher can just teach yourself bioinformatics, you could hire a data scientist, you could recruit a new grad student. Um, but it turns out, you know, especially in my opinion, these are some suboptimal options. Uh, teaching yourself a field as complex as bioinformatics is not something you do in an afternoon. Hiring a data scientist is a great idea if you have a lot of questions and you're gonna be working on this for a long time. But if you just wanna know where gene A expresses, spending all the time and resources to recruit and, and uh, work with a data scientist could be basically prohibitive. And recruiting a grad student, I'm sure my boss will tell you, comes with plenty of bags of worms, both good and, you know, good and bad. Um, and so really we'd love to see some other kind of solution here that will let uh, researchers of all level of kind of programming and informatic expertise to access these uh, pieces of, of data and plots that actually let them generate new hypotheses. So our solution was to build a, a tool which we've called MyCV, a multi-informatic cellular visualization tool. Uh, multi-informatic, I hope you guys can see this little video here, uh, refers to our initial inception of this project, which was just this page, which in the current web tool, if you're on there, is the expert analysis page. Um, it has a couple of different plots all in the same page, which we think provide uh, different views of the same data that are all gonna be very useful to a researcher in different contexts. We can see in the top left, some automated clustering has been done on the data set by the computer that might guide the uh, user to 
look for, um, you know, cell type differences within these automated clusters. There's a pseudo time projection plot, pseudo time analysis and single cell sequencing helps us to kind of line up cells by the set of least differences so that in the bottom right here, you can actually calculate gene trends along pseudo time and figure out which uh, cells in this pathway actually wind up expressing genes and when they start expressing them particularly useful in the context of developing or differentiating cell populations. We have ways to interrogate the expression of specific genes and automatically pull up information from databases that help authors not just, or researchers not just identify where specific genes are being expressed, but if they're actually worth following up or if their function is actually related to um, what they're, they're interested in. This uh, integrated view of many different facets of uh, you know, a standard bioinformatics pipeline is kind of unprecedented uh, from what we can see in the literature. And uh, in our experience, working on that paper that I mentioned earlier, all of these pieces of information uh, provided useful views of, of our data set that helped us to reinform our hypotheses and get as close to the reproducible biological ground truth as possible. Uh, and we tried to encapsulate, you know, this this view into our icon here, and we're looking for feedback on it. So please um, shoot me a, shoot me an email if you do or don't like it. Um, the big thing that I think many biologists who just want to see, you know, a gene expression plot will find useful is that we've taken what I've drawn up here as kind of a typical single cell sequencing kind of pre-processing pipeline with many different parameters and steps and things to consider and done something kind of maybe too bold and just replaced it all with a single button that just recalculates everything based off of a set of what we deem to be kind of sane default values. Um, that's not to say that there aren't controls when you want, there are not controls when you want them. There are, you can change pretty much any parameter in this pipeline that you want, but by default, you need not actually look at them. You can go from uploading your data to looking at meaningful and relevant plots at the push of a button and in the time it takes you to walk up and get a cup of coffee, basically. Um, there's a wide variety of features here that we've implemented. Some are useful to all researchers in this space. Some are more niche, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we think that it's gonna be applicable to many different uh, kinds of single cell biologists in the future. And the way that we were able to get away with doing this, I keep saying we, but really this was yeah, over the past few months, I just kind of threw all this together, uh, is because we didn't actually recode, you know, unlike our last um, presenter who did a remarkable job uh, recoding all that stuff, we didn't recode hardly anything. We actually just built a UI wrapper on top of kind of best in class single cell analysis tools, in particular, those provided by ScanPy, a Python package for doing single cell analysis alongside a whole bunch of other stuff to make this, you know, quote unquote, web scale. Um, so in, in this view, what we haven't done is, or what we, we've done is not particularly groundbreaking uh, in the computational sense, but we think might open doors for a lot of researchers who otherwise would find this Python package, ScanPy, or R packages for doing single cell analysis, uh, too intractable to actually be used on a regular basis. So I'm not actually going to demo my CV at this point, although I can in the question and answer session show off any features people are interested in. Uh, rather, I'd like to talk briefly about kind of how we see this tool being further developed in the future. So there's a number of things, you know, you can see from the website that's already there. But one of the biggest things that we're hoping to change or tweak in the future is the user interface. As a tool that's trying to be the, the first stop for a biology researcher in this space, one of the most important things is that it's easy enough to use and intuitive enough to use that people will actually adopt it. And so over the next few months, uh, the tool that we have is going to be up there, but we're going to be aggressively testing and getting feedback from uh, potential users to refine our, I mean, things as simple as our choice of where to put plots on the screen and where to put control panels. Um, because, I mean, quite frankly, I'm a biophysics student. I, I, don't, I don't have a degree uh, in 
doing UI development. Um, and so we, we need to uh, make sure that the interface that we're providing to users is as simple and intuitive as possible um, to continue to bridge that gap between the experiment and the analysis. We're hoping to do that partially by adding two interfaces, kind of a basic and expert one, uh, an expert one that has many of these newer tools that are down here, and a basic one that really just gets you straight from the matrix to your plots. Um, and we're also hoping, and something that was pointed out by the judges, um, to implement a data set sharing uh, feature, which will allow users to not only share the raw data with one another through our platform, but also to share all of the analysis steps and parameters that went into doing the analysis on that data set with other authors or other researchers so that they can A, see, see that the data is reproducible, the analysis is reproducible, and B, tweak parameters to see if very large changes in the way that you might interpret the data can be brought about by changing, you know, the number of neighbors in your clustering algorithm and so on and so forth. There's also a number of performance enhancements that largely I mean, are done. Uh, I put this, you know, web scale data set storage. Uh, we've already implemented this. We're hoping because people keep pushing out these data sets that have millions of cells to implement or, or um, piggyback off of other projects that are multi-threading and uh, GPU accelerating this code. Um, and I'll kind of end by saying that uh, this is a lot for uh, one guy to do. So if you're interested in replacing some of these stock images uh, and actually using the tool, providing some feedback or coding with me, I'd really love for you to reach out and get in touch because there's quite a lot of features that we're hoping to throw into here in, in the, the near to long-term future. And any help that the community, uh, in particular the single cell community can provide will be absolutely invaluable. So that's where I'm actually gonna end for now to leave more time for questions for both myself and John. Um, I want to point out um, some people who have helped. You know, I developed this tool, but uh, a number of people in the lab, both my PI, Dawin, and two colleagues, Logan and Ye, in our lab, um, seen here and here, are um, were, were instrumental in helping to kind of form the idea for this web tool, come up with the name. Um, and actually, Dawin in particular has done more beta testing than I could ever ask. Um, We'd also like to recognize, of course, that we're building this on top of so many different open source projects. Um, and definitely, as John was kind of mentioning, you know, the we, we're in kind of a blessed space because so many people are so willing to share code, um, but that is not always a given. And so we're very thankful to the authors of these projects. I'm also thankful to everyone else in the Scilab, past and present, some of whom are uh, pictured here. Uh, for all of their feedback, listening to my talks, and again, helping to um, refine the development of this tool. And if you're interested, I'll, I'll throw in a quick pitch, if you're interested not just in single cell sequencing, but other complex uh, projects that are at the interface of high throughput um, biological experiments and um, large scale data science, single cell sequencing, neural connectomics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're always looking to uh, bring on new people. So please give, a, give us a shout. And uh, with that, I think I'll hand it back over to the moderator. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks very much for another very interesting presentation. So um, I'm gonna ask the audience members to put their questions down at this point in Q&A or chat, either way is fine. Um, meantime, uh, let me ask you guys each a question. Um, so for Nigel, what, what I want to know is um, this kind of effort, you know, trying to uh, help people choose the right tools and uh, make sense of, you know, so many black boxes out there, uh, in a sense. Um, so. I would imagine there are actually a lot of groups trying to do this, you know, or they're trying to, you know, work things out for themselves and then benefit the community along the way. So are we replacing a set of black boxes with another set of black boxes? Oh, that's, How, that's a great question. Yeah. 
Uh, sorry, I, I can let you finish. Um, yeah. I, 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 yeah, that's right. a great question. Um, I guess the the simple answer is probably yes in a certain in a certain context, right? If if we're providing an interface for people to without, you know, without thinking, start to generate plots and with those plots generate hypotheses about their data, then, then you're absolutely correct, right? It's just become a much larger black box that contains other black boxes. Um, I guess one of the counterpoints slash advantages of our approach is that we've not re-implemented anything. Uh, and so, while we've put this box around other black boxes, we've not tried to recode anything from ScanPy or, or recode anything from other authors. We're just providing an interface uh, for people who probably don't have, I mean, quite frankly, don't have the programming chops to, to sit down at the terminal and spend a week or two figuring out how to filter cells uh, and get them asking meaningful questions about their data set. Because in our view, um, the analysis steps, while important, uh, are only part of the equation. Really what needs to happen is we need to get to a point in our analysis where we can start forming new biological hypotheses and testing them back in the tissue. Uh, there's there's no, better, no better way to ensure that your analysis is correct and reproducible than going back to the biology and, and making sure that what you think your analysis is telling you, black box or not, um, is actually what's happening because even if I, you know, I, I understand how these algorithms work, but that doesn't give me any extra confidence that my analysis is correct in this context. I could go through other examples from that paper that we just put put out, but there's a number of circumstances where we see basically cell type clustering that doesn't match the literature. Um, and it's only resolvable by going back to the tissue, looking at the actual spatial expression profiles of these genes and rectifying that with the literature. The analysis on its own is, is only a stepping point. So yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, definitely it's not where the story ends, but uh, I think it will be useful nonetheless. Yeah. So uh, sort of a follow up question for, for both teams, I guess is this kind of that helps others to improve reproducibility is important, but also it's hard because there aren't a lot of resources specifically funding for this kind of work. So for, for I think, you know, what I mean is, is whether you are, whether you intend to work with places like, you know, our own bioinformatics core, or other places to, you know, sort of both to seek resource, but also to make your work more uh, um, sort of widely used by others. And for, for John's group, I also wonder uh, whether you guys had any, any funding support or anything for this, you know, or did you guys just realize, you know, let's just go over 810 papers and see where, <laughs> where they got, what did well and where they didn't do well. <laughs> We were very enthusiastic PhD students, um, but uh, but actually, <laughs> I think Swati can speak um, uh, quite a bit to to kind of um, uh, funding related follow ups to that. If I, if I, uh, so this is an excellent question, and I think there's some NSF programs now that are going more towards uh, building benchmarks and building uh, uh, packages and open sourcing. And, and this is something that we often see in NSF proposals that you have to have a broader research uh, dissemination. You have to actually say that you're uh, open sourcing or you're releasing the code bases that are developed even as a part of theoretical research. So there is definitely a push from the funding agencies. But the amazing part about this research, even though we did not have funding to start this, uh, once we did all of this work, this got picked up in a DARPA project actually for uh, quantum computing. Uh, and DARPA uh, gave our team like um, some $9 million. Uh, for, for the benchmarking part is, is uh, a small, it's, it's mostly to build a quantum computer, but, but it's, it was uh, uh, quite amazing that, you know, this, this work, even though we started uh, with more uh, the reprodu reproducibility aspect in our mind and thinking about, you know, bringing this research more transparent and bringing it across uh, to uh, 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 the broader field. I think as uh, 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 Nigel actually put it very nicely, 
the initial name for our project was graph conjecture generator. So we, we wanted to do all of this analysis also to understand, you know, what are, uh, where do algorithms work well, or can we find, uh, you know, counter examples to conjectures and graph theory. So it was, it was more of a diagnostic tool. And then it sort of uh, went into this amazing uh, uh, reproducible um, code base. So for my part, um, that, that's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to kind of develop this on my own uh, while working on another project in the lab. But for continued development, you're right. So there's not an enormous amount of support that I, at least I can identify for my specific uh, problem. I know the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation has funded similar projects. Um, or, and they fund like ScanPy, you know, the core of my analysis. Um, I won't, you know, reveal all the details, but my, my plan to actually continue this in the future is actually to try to commercialize this as a service. So the, the code is all open source, but hopefully um, by having people adopt a small subscription fee for a convenient service, I'll be able to fund continued development after I leave the lab in the future. I don't know how it's going to go. Uh, I mean, I'm not... I'm not a business person, but um, there, there is not a ton of support that I've seen anyway. So uh, I think that I'm just going to try and bootstrap it and, and see uh, what I can put out there for the next couple of years. And worst case scenario, it'll just be a somewhat more developed tool that will sit in the open source, uh, you know, repos forever. So, yeah. So do you guys, uh, both of you, both, both of the groups, do you guys, um, so basically, I think what I'm trying to get at is this kind of uh, trying to standardize, you know, the the analysis and so forth. I think they're they're more useful for, uh, I would say, inexperienced users, right, than um, you know, veterans in in the field. But on the other hand, the shared tools, you know, usually pose a bigger challenge for beginning users than sophisticated users, right? So. Um, I think you guys each touched on a little bit on that, you know, like Nigel was saying, you know, make everything, you know, into a, you know, sort of button push sort of thing. And then that also brings the question of how people actually know they, do, they did it right. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, mine most, I mean, maybe it's a little bit too bold or, or too brash, but, but mine most simply is uh, they know they did it right when they go back to the biological tissue and they see that the interpretation of their data based off of the button push, as we call it, uh, is correct or incorrect, and they revise it as such. Uh, when I did my project and my paper, I was still learning all of this uh, kind of on my own. Uh, and I think that for the most part, I and my advisor used all of the analysis that we did just as a stepping off point for actually going back to the real world. And so, I mean, quite frankly, I don't really care if it's right or, or wrong. I, I mostly care that it's um, useful enough that someone can make a meaningful hypothesis that they can go and test. And that, for me, that's, that's all it means. Uh, but but it is not, that's not necessarily appropriate for every context. So I, I, I think what might be useful, uh, Nigel, if you want uh, a broader ad, uh, adoption of your tool might be to you know, post some sanity check questions, which are very obvious to you, but they may not be obvious to uh, uh, other users who are inexperienced, right? Like sometimes some of these prompts are just very useful. Mm -hmm. I uh, have been working with some uh, uh, doctors and uh, the hematocratin levels and all of that just goes above my head. But uh, you know, sometimes we can look at charts and figures and interpret and, and talk about you know if if this yeah. even makes sense or if yeah. you're yeah. right. And that's, that's that's a great that's a great idea. Yeah, I know I've put some of those little prompts or or mm -hmm. tutorial helps when you select mm -hmm. parameters. I tell people you know what what does this parameter kind of modify? Mm -hmm. But but when mm -hmm. you actually think about interpreting the data, yeah, it would be great to have some kind of example mm -hmm. sanity checks. Yeah, it's a great yeah. idea. And, uh, and, and to maybe follow up a little bit on uh, Jing's uh, uh, question. So what I've found to be successful in the past and also talking to a bunch of colleagues who uh, actually are into developing code bases is to give people very interesting applications that they can parse. So, uh, you know, 
maybe the application is uh, you know, finding a bunch of authors who have similar names on a Google Scholar profile for Max Card, for instance. You know, if, if this is the application and, and you have some, some CVs that people can simply open and check, and then they can convert that into the mathematical problem, then sometimes having some of these applications completely worked out in the package just have a wider, um, help the wider use and accessibility of, uh, of code bases. And this is what we've also seen in some of the Julia packages. So, uh, and, and maybe Ian can add uh, onto that more. Uh, but uh, uh, for some of the convex jail package, which is super technical um, uh, to use, even for people who are pretty comfortable with optimization, I think that the key engagement point was to give them applications from finance or you know very meaningful, parsable, like tangible uh, ideas and um, or, or social. Like right now, algorithmic fairness is a pretty uh, big topic of discussion um, across uh, uh, multiple areas and uh, fields applications and I think if we can uh, just expand that uh, to have you know where people feel like you know they're not just learning something that's super technical but even having an impact on the society those those would be my um, uh, best approaches <laughs> guides to having a wider accessibility to people who don't appreciate the technical um, details okay so um, I don't see any question from the audience at this time. And since, uh, since time is up, uh, let's just wrap up here and thank you all very much for this wonderful, for the wonderful presentation, but mostly for the wonderful work that you guys have been doing. And this time for, for us to offer this reproducible challenge really was, I mean, for, for us really was a great opportunity to see what creative ideas and all the hard work that people have been doing. And it's really very, very inspiring. So thank you all. Thank you, Jing. And, yeah. and thank, you thank, thank you for organizing it. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.